G'day and welcome back for another Space Engineers tutorial. Last time we took our little hydrogen powered ship all the way up to space and brought it back. But there was something I would have liked to add to this which we couldn't add at the time and that is a survival kit. Survival kits require medical components. Right now the only medical components we have are in our survival kit on our base and I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to take the risk of removing this and putting it in something that I might crash into the ground at high speed, given that if that happens, I have nowhere to respawn. The reason we can't build more medical components is that they require silver. They require 6.67 each, and right now we have no means to refine it. The basic refinery cannot refine silver. It also can't refine gold, uranium, or platinum. It can refine silicon, cobalt, nickel, stone, magnesium and iron, but it can't do those remaining four. So we need a full sized refinery. And these things are pretty big. It's a 2x2x4 two by two by sized block. We've got a conveyor port on each side which line up perfectly with each other and then we've got one on the top and the bottom which also line up in a straight line with each other. Then on the back of the refinery, you've got these eight smaller ports. These are not conveyor ports. These are upgrade module slots. And you have eight of them, so you can attach upgrade modules to increase your yield, your power efficiency, and the speed of the refinery. But we'll look into those later in this video. I'm gonna place this in a little bit of an unusual spot. I'm gonna place it underneath our conveyor port here. So lining up the conveyor ports like that. The reason for this is if I connected it up to our cargo container here, I would end up with stuff point poking out to where this drill rig is currently and I don't really want to do that just yet. The important thing with the placement of the refinery is that we've got our upgrade module ports available to us so that we can place the upgrade modules on them. So we need a one block space above each of them. To make all of the steel plate that I needed for this refinery, I went out and I mined some iron specifically. The reason I did that is that with how many steel plate we need, I was going to have to make several trips with collecting stone just to get enough iron, whereas I could make a single trip to collect iron. And now we have our refinery complete. By completing the refinery, I have now unlocked our speed, yield and power efficiency modules. So let's take a closer look at a couple of those. I'm gonna clear a couple of things off the hotbar by right clicking on them. Add speed, yield, and power efficiency. So I've jumped into creative mode and I've set up five refineries here. The first one here is just completely blank. It's got nothing special on it. Then we've got a speed module on this one. And if I bring up my tool, I can highlight that. Then we've got a yield module on this one, a power efficiency module on this one. And lastly, a speed module that's half attached and half not. By going into the control panel of our first refinery, we can look at the basic statistics for the refinery. The maximum required power input is 560 kilowatts and productivity, effectiveness, and power efficiency are all 100%. It also tells us that we've used zero of eight upgrade module slots. If we move down to our refinery with our speed module on, you'll see that we've doubled our maximum required power input from 560 kilowatts to 1.12 megawatts. We've also doubled our productivity. Effectively, what this speed module has done is created a situation where we've got the same results we would have from adding a second refinery, but without the same costs as the speed module is much, much cheaper than another refinery. And we can continue to add speed modules to the back of this refinery to further enhance that effect. So if we have four of them, this little unit here is going to be as effective as five refineries without any upgrade modules. It'll also cost as much power as five refineries. So you can see productivity 500% and our max required input is 2.8 megawatts, which is five times 560 mega, uh, kilowatts. If we then move down to here where we've got our yield module on our refinery, these yield modules, they increase the amount of material you get from a certain amount of ore. So if we put 100 ore into this, 100 cobalt, we'll get a certain amount from this. If we go back to our original refinery and do the same, we can then compare the results. Our refinery with no upgrade modules on it produced 30 kilograms of cobalt ingots from the 100 kilograms of cobalt ore. 
but with our yield module on board, we've increased that yield to 35.68 kilograms. So we've gained an extra five and a bit kilos beyond what we got before. This can be quite handy if you're not in a rush to get your materials, or if you've got materials that you could only collect a certain amount of and it took you forever to get. And for this reason, yield modules tend to be my preferred modules to put onto my refineries. I'm not usually in too much of a hurry to get the materials, so speed modules become less of an issue. But there are times, especially when I'm collecting something from a long way away, where I don't want to have to go back there again. So if I can increase the amount I've gotten from what I collected, that's going to be a big benefit. The next upgrade module is our power efficiency module. This thing reduces the amount of power you need for your refinery. So instead of 560 kilowatts, we're down down to 374. And this is only slightly more than our basic refinery costs. I'd like to demonstrate a difference between the refinery and the basic refinery by breaking down some stone. So if I put 500 stone in here, we've just gotten 27 kilograms of iron from that. If I go over to my basic refinery, I get just 18.9 kilograms. I get even less if I use the survival kit. So if you have access to a full-sized refinery and you're drilling stone, it is advantageous to use this compared to your basic refinery. I was able to do that demonstration with the power efficiency module because it does not increase our effectiveness. If I'd put this in something with an extra yield module on it, I would have gotten even more again. Up until this point, I've put all of my upgrade modules directly onto the refinery with both of their upgrade slots. So if we look at the back of our speed module, you can see here there are two slots that line up to the two on the back of the refinery. But you can create a partial effect from an upgrade module by placing it like this. Nicely, each of these upgrade modules have little glowing lights to tell you whether they're on a block and functional, green, or whether they're completely built, powered, but not attached to an upgrade slot, which is yellow, or if they're just unpowered or not completely functional, they'll be red. When a block is like this, it's only on a single upgrade slot for the refinery. So in this case, we will get half the effect, as we can see here with a productivity of 150%, compared to a speed module that's covering two of the slots. A speed module crossing two like that will give you the exact same effect as these two speed modules on the top here. These two are covering two of the refinery's upgrade slots, and so is this one. So if we've got multiple refineries next to each other and for aesthetic reasons you want to vary the pattern between them, you can do this without having any negative effects. So as an example, something like this is completely effective. All of my upgrade modules are attached to the refineries and both refineries have all of their upgrade slots covered. What we've got is a collection of yield modules and then one speed module. So as I said before, I would really like to have yield modules attached to my refinery here. However, I can't do that yet. Yield modules, if we have a look at our components required, need superconductors. Superconductors need gold. And superconductors can also only be made from a fully fledged assembler. If we have a look at our production window from our basic assembler, we do not have superconductor components here. So I'm going to need to add an assembler to my base and then I'll need to mine some gold so that I can make some superconductor components. I'm going to pop my assembler out here. The reason to do that is that like the refinery, the assembler has upgrade module slots. There are eight of them that go along the long sides of the assembler. On each end, you have conveyor ports and on two of the long sides, you also have conveyor ports. If you look carefully at these conveyor ports versus the one on the refinery to my left, you can see that there's a small square on the inside of it as well. That's because that area of the to the right of the assembler from the way we're looking at it at the moment is both a conveyor port and an upgrade module slot. So I'm going to place this on our refinery end like that. That'll give us access to everything we want so that we can put lots of upgrade modules on this assembler. When I'm building an assembler in survival, I will frequently repurpose the materials from my basic assembler and put them into my final assembler. The assembler takes pretty much twice the materials that the basic assembler does. 
but it also adds 10 metal grids. So if you've made 10 metal grids and you've made enough parts that you can break down your basic assembler, it's certainly worth your while considering it. In this case, so that I can demonstrate some more things, I'm going to build everything so that I've got both and we'll be able to show you the differences between the two. And there we go, assembler complete. If we now have a look at the difference in the production window from the assembler versus the basic assembler, we can notice some nice improvements with having the fully fledged assembler. First of all, you get access to all of the components, including the superconductors, the thruster components, reactor components, etc. And we also get better tools available to us if we've got the resources for them. And we also get these two windows. These are quite handy. If I want to order the components for a specific block, say we go large grid and go yield module, I can click on this and it will queue up all of the components for that block. You can click it multiple times to queue up the components for multiples of them. And that can be very, very useful to figure out what you need more of in order to build what you're planning. If you already know what blocks you're wanting to build. If we compare that to the production window from our basic assembler, we don't have those two extra menu options and we have fewer tools that we can make. We look at our survival kit, there's even less again. So really, there's no reason to use the other two for building stuff. The assembler will be our best option and our easiest, our quickest, but it does require a little bit more power. So our assembler requires 560 kilowatts and our basic assembler requires 280. We could, if we needed to, attach some power efficiency modules to our assembler to reduce its power requirements. We can also add some speed modules to increase its speed further. You can't add yield modules, however. These do not work on assemblers. They do not produce any effect whatsoever. In fact, if I just quickly cheat and go into creative mode just to demonstrate this, if I put a yield module on our assembler and have a look in here, you'll, say, you'll see that it says yield module incompatible. If you're wondering how I got into creative mode so quickly, Alt F10, in the admin tools list, there's an enable creative mode tools checkbox. And we'll go back out of that now that I've deleted the yield module. Something useful to note with the assembler menu here, this required and available is just what's in the inventory of the assembler itself. So we've got 10 iron, 3 cobalt, 0.3 gold. And you can see that we've got our 10 iron available, 3.33 cobalt and our 0.3 gold. So even though we've got these materials elsewhere in the base, you will not see it show up here until the assembler pulls what it needs for the next little group of items it's planning on building. And it doesn't pull it all at once. It's kind of handy that it doesn't pull it all at once because it doesn't have a large capacity. You can also get a useful little tip over here by mousing over the components that you've got queued up. Right now, it's telling us that we can't build this because it's disabled. That's because I have turned off the assembler. If I turn it on, we now can't build this thruster component because it's missing items. It's missing the platinum. Something that can happen to your assembler and can be quite frustrating is, some, is that it can end up with its input inventory full. If this happens and you're building something that requires parts that you haven't got in that input inventory, you will not be able to build anything. You can see here it says superconductor, missing items. It can't build this thing even though we know we've got all of the stuff required. That's because it can't pull anything in here. If I take some of this gravel out, the assembler will then pull some gold in and we'll be able to continue production of the superconductor components. So if you're ever having troubles with not having the required components and you know they're there and you've checked your conveyor systems and they're all intact, check your inventory and ensure that your assembler isn't full in its intake inventory as that can be something that happens particularly when you order and cancel multiple things as it will gradually accumulate some items. You can also see that there are other tooltips that will show up such as not enough power. And this will help you determine what's going on and I had to turn all of my batteries off which is why that little rover is driving away and I'm going to have to retrieve that in a moment. But these tooltips can be quite handy to keep an eye on if you're struggling to figure out why you haven't been able to produce anything from your assembler. Get back here. 
With assemblers, I've mainly been focused on what's going on over this side. We've also got a few buttons over this side which I haven't looked at yet. The first is disassembling. This allows you to deconstruct items that you have in your inventory. Right now, I've got a few steel plate in the cargo container that's attached to this. So if I select disassemble, I can queue up a few of those. It will then pull the steel plates into the inventory of the assembler and it will break them down, producing iron as a result. You get 100% of your resources back when you do this. So you don't lose anything from transferring between one and the other, except for the power used for the conversion. Let's switch this back to assembling. And then let's have a look at these two buttons. We have enable or disable cooperative mode and we have enable or disable repeat mode. Let's enable repeat mode. What this allows you to do is endlessly produce whatever is in the queue. As you can see here, it builds a steel plate, then it pulls more iron, then it builds a steel plate. You can also notice that there's a bit of a delay here. That's because there's a certain time gap between when the assemblers can pull more resources into themselves. So what we want to do if we want to make this maximally efficient is queue up a few more steel plate so it can pull enough to cover that gap between the intervals where it can pull resources. And now you can see that we're producing steel plates much more rapidly. If one assembler isn't enough for you and you want another assembler to help, then you can use cooperative mode. We'll disable repeat mode for the moment. The way that I like to think about cooperative mode is to think of your assemblers as having one master assembler and then all of the other ones as secondary assemblers. So in this case, we'll have our main assembler as assembler, then we'll go to assembler two and we'll enable cooperative mode on it. Do not enable cooperative mode on your master assembler. So if I were now to queue up hundred motors, you'll see that assembler two has pulled some of that queue for itself and it will build those for us. So we'll have both assemblers working together. You can also add basic assemblers to this. They can also do cooperative mode and they will pull any items that they can produce from this queue. So it'll pull those motors. But if I try and build thruster components or superconductor components, while our assembler number two will pull from that queue. And if we move those motors to the back of the queue, we can see that assembler two has pulled some of these thruster components into its queue, but the basic assembler is not pulling anything. It will only try and build the stuff that it can do. And because that's not at the front of the queue, it's not doing anything. So it's not the best way to set things up to try and use a basic assembler in this mode, but it is an option available to us. Now it's time for me to go and collect some of that gold so that we can pop a few yield modules on our refinery and then move on to the last thing I want to do for today, which is have a look at the medical bay. Start building our yield module here on the back. Make sure we've got the upgrade ports from the yield module lined up to our refinery. And as soon as my assembler has completed the first 20 superconductors, I'll be able to build that yield module, which will increase the amount I get from the remaining amount of my gold that I have not yet refined. There we go, yield module on, and second yield module almost complete as well. Our effectiveness is up to 119%. We've got two attached modules, one functioning. It'll tell us that the other yield module that we've got on there is currently damaged, which you know, I suppose it technically is. It's more incomplete than damaged really though. And we should have the remaining superconductor components very shortly. There we go, we're now up to 141% effectiveness. We're gonna get a lot more gold from that gold ore, and we're going to get a lot more iron, nickel, and silicon from any stone that we mine and deliver to the base. So given that we've got better production facilities, I'm going to remove both of these. If you were in a situation where you had a where you had enough ore that your refinery was constantly busy and you still wanted to refine some stone for a particular project that was under a bit of time pressure, you may consider keeping your basic refinery to continue to refine down any stone you've got. However, I tend to move towards refineries as quickly as possible, as long as I've got the space for them. These things being big, you will have to have a decent amount of room to build multiples. So I'm going to grind down my basic assembler because I'm almost certainly not going to be using it and I'm going to remove my basic refinery. The reason I'm getting rid of both of these is I'm going to be moving all of this stuff anyway, but I wanted to create a little bit of space for us to place down a medical room. Go to our production window, go to our large blocks and type in med. And let's order up all the parts we need for our medical room. A 
believe we should have just enough silver to get by for that. Yeah, we've got more than enough. It requires 100 and we've got 217. You can see that it requires 100 right here. We've also got enough silicon, cobalt. We may be short on nickel though. So I'll need to collect some of that before we can get this thing complete. While that's being produced, let's have a look at the medical room. This thing fills a 2x2x1 space, but it only has two attachment points, and that's a really important part about the medical room. On the top here, you have a conveyor port, and that is one of the two attachment points for our medical room. The other one is the conveyor port on the bottom. Despite the flat areas above and to the left of the conveyor port, they do not attach to the blocks. What I mean by this is, if you have those as your only supports and nothing's attached to either conveyor port, this medical room becomes loose. It becomes a separate grid to whatever it was previously attached to. That means it will not work because it won't have power, but also it can bounce around and it can damage or destroy significant parts of your ship as it shakes around. So you want to be very careful with medical rooms that you always keep one of the two attached while you're working around it. Like the survival kit, you will need to have this hooked up to a conveyor system if you want to have gases supplied when you go to the medical room to recharge. I'm going to place this, I think we'll go in here like so. And just to demonstrate that attachment point thing, if I then grind this block away, that medical room is now loose. You can confirm that it's loose if I go into our control panel and type in medical. There is nothing there. This thing is broken. So I want to make sure that I don't do things like that. Pop that down. Oh, in fact, let's not put that that way. Let's put it this way so we can have our conveyor port over in that corner lined up directly with the refinery, which means we can also do this and grab a conveyor tube and link it up like so. That way it will be able to refill our gases once we've built this thing. If I'm building something like this medical bay and I need to carry all of the components and medical components are pretty big, I can only carry six of them to the block and back to the cargo to back and forth. And I'm not as close as I am in this situation. There is a nice little trick you can use to make this work a little bit easier for things like refineries, for hydrogen tanks, that sort of thing. The trips can be quite time consuming. So if you've got a conveyor port that is hooked up to your cargo system and it's nearby the block that you're trying to build, what you can do, and I'm going to remove these temporarily, you can place a grid welder in that spot. So we've got welders, grinders, and drills. Let's grab a welder and have a look at this block. It's got conveyor ports on three sides, none on the other two. And then at the business end of things, we've got these two welding tips. If those are near enough to the block we're trying to weld, this thing will weld and transport all the materials to that block for us. So what I'm going to do is place this vertically here. That puts those tips right on our medical room. And we can then build this instead of building our medical room. And the nice thing about that is that even large grid welders don't require many components. In fact, they require so few that I can carry them all even with times three inventory. So I just grabbed a bunch of components and hopefully I got the right number and I did. So I can build this welder in one go. I can then hop into the control panel for it and turn it on. It's now going to weld up that medical room with all of the components that are in this cargo container and in our assembler without me having to do anything. One thing to note though is don't get too close to the business end of a welder. It hurts. As you can see here, ow, very hurts, hurts a lot. <laughs> so be careful around that. And when you're done with it, simply grind it down and you're good to go and move it somewhere else if you want to build up something big elsewhere. I'm also going to put down my conveyor tubes again and weld these up before we demonstrate the medical room. You might be wondering what's the point of building something that requires so many components when you've already got a survival kit that does all the same stuff. Well, the survival kit does do all the same stuff, but it does it really slowly. If you look carefully at my health and my power meter, 
when I go to the survival kit, I gain them both quite slowly. Gases do get filled very quickly, but the health and power is very slow. Each little chunk that I get from the survival kit is only 8 points. The medical room, however, does this much, much faster. As you can see, that only took two little goes and my power is full and my health went up much faster as well. So there is an advantage to having a medical room that is quite useful because I hate waiting to recharge. This recharging this quickly is so, so nice. There's another little thing that the medical room can do that the survival kit can't. I'm just going to give myself a little bit of a platform here to work from. Over here, you've got another spot you can interact with. If I press F on this, I can then customize my character with all of the different helmets, suits, gloves, boots that I've got that I've collected from unknown signals or bought off the Steam marketplace or traded with friends or however you got hold of them. Like our veteran suit that I got from completing the learning to survive scenario. That same menu is accessible from the main game menu. So you can modify your suit there, but it is nice if you want to use something you just picked up from an unknown signal to be able to use it in game without having to quit your game and go back out to the main menu. With our assembler, our refinery, our medical room and all of the other components on this base, we've now got pretty much everything that I would consider necessary for a fully fledged base, but it's organized horribly. We've got our hydrogen ship up here, which we can only access if we've got jetpack fuel. We've got this really awkwardly dangling out here and we've got not much room because of where we placed our drill platform. So what I'm going to do over the coming tutorials is I'm going to go through building a somewhat more attractively designed base and doing things like building blast doors, all that sort of fun stuff in individual tutorials so that we can have a look at different design processes for that. If there's something you're interested in having a look at related to base design, let me know and hopefully I'll be able to include it in the next few tutorials. So there's all that and plenty more to come and I will see you then.